Hi, this is Professor Paul Knopfler here at UC Davis School of Medicine. I'm a stem cell and cancer researcher, and I also do educational outreach, including through this YouTube channel. So if you like these videos, please subscribe because there'll be more to come. The focus of today's video is on the idea of using cord blood cells or stem cells to treat autism spectrum disorder. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and share my screen uh, with a recent post that I did, and we can kind of go through this as a way of talking about the key issues here. So first of all, just to orient you, this is my website called The Niche. It's all about stem cells and other cutting edge technologies and cell therapies more generally. And here's a post I did recently, fact checking the idea of using stem cell or other cell therapies for autism. And I think it's still a risky idea. And there's been some recent <clears throat> developments related to Duke um, and their core blood for autism program that I'm going to mention as well. So uh, this is kind of oftentimes how I'll structure a post. I'll kind of give a summary of it. And there are these jump links you can go to. It's almost like a table of contents. And then sometimes I also have kind of a, an overall claim review here, and, and you can look at that as well. And again, this website is at ipscell.com. Here's just some of the um, kind of almost like marketing material, you could say, uh, for the Duke Center for Autism, um, encouraging people to enroll in their trials for autism. So it's important when we're talking about um, the Duke program to emphasize that Duke is doing clinical trials in this area, but they also have what's called expanded, expanded access programs or EAPs that allow for um, uh, essentially uh, giving uh, experimental treatments and requiring payments from families for autism and other childhood conditions. So this is one of the reasons why I got so interested in this topic in the first place is I noticed that Duke was doing these clinical trials using cord blood cells, and this was for autism and cerebral palsy as well. And um, more recently, they're also, I think, looking at uh, traumatic brain injury. And I had some real concerns about this because there wasn't good evidence to suggest or support the hypothesis that cord blood cells would help autism. And I'm gonna kind of go through today um, sort of the ideas there and some of the tough questions I have sort of had come to mind that I don't think those who are really uh, so enthusiastic about pushing this forward, uh, you know, I really don't think they can answer them very well. So the basic idea here is that you have kids with uh, autism spectrum disorder, you have families that want to try to uh, give them some kind of uh, medical treatment that might, might help things uh, seem better. And so with stem cells, the idea, or I should say with cells in general, because some of these cells are not stem cells, the idea is that you give uh, these cells to the kids with autism IV. So it goes in the arm. And then somehow this is supposed to help the kids with autism. And uh, Duke, uh, one of the challenges is that Duke has done clinical trials on this and basically found largely negative data. So they don't meet their, their endpoints. Uh, sometimes people have tried to look for sort of glimmers of hopeful findings in some of the data. This is uh, kind of called a post hoc analysis. But generally, the, the, the trials have been pretty discouraging, and that's true for cerebral palsy as well. Uh, so these trials have been ongoing. <clears throat> and again, as I said, at the same time, they're, they're offering the cord cells uh, to families for something around $15,000 on a compassionate use basis or expanded access basis. And so there's sort of been this interesting dynamic between the actual clinical trials and then the expanded access programs. And as the trials have given negative data, it's been sort of odd because the expanded access programs nonetheless have kept going. You know, and so if your trials are telling you cord blood cells are not so encouraging for autism, then why are you keeping uh, charging family $15,000 to give their children cord cells? And then of course, any kind of medical procedure like that, giving cord cells to kids is gonna have risks even if those risks might seem. So along the way, and kind of thinking about all these things, these questions uh, have, have come to mind and I don't, <clears throat> again, see good answers out there. And so when you give kids cord blood cells IV, again, it just goes into their systemic circulation. How would that help autism, which is a neurological condition? So one of the first things to ask is, do any of those cells actually get into the brain tissue itself? And it seems like the answer has mostly been no. Uh, and this has sort of gone back and forth over the years. I think early on proponents 
claimed that the cells did get into the brain. Now I haven't heard that claim so much. And, and instead, they're saying, no, they don't get into the brain. And so if the cells don't get into the brain, then the next question is, well, how do they help um, autism, autism as a condition if they don't even get into the brain? So there you have to kind of invoke an indirect mechanism where you're saying, well, maybe they change the immune system in some way. So it's more of a systemic thing. You're not actually directly acting on the brain to help uh, autism in some way. And so that I think is much more tenuous. You know, there are, there are immunological aspects to autism, but it, it's not as though everyone with autism spectrum disorder, it's going to have an immunological comp component. And then do cord cells even potentially target autism related immunological changes or not? And the data is pretty weak, I would say. And so these are, you know, these are questions again, that really don't have answers. And yet these expanded access programs until recently have continued. Uh, and of course, a big question is what causes autism spectrum disorder? And as a spectrum, there's probably many different components that contribute to this, you know, genetic elements, there could be other factors involved as well beyond the immune system. <clears throat> there could be environmental factors. And so there's a lot going on here. And so if you don't have a good grasp on what is causing say particular uh, types of autism, even then, uh, how can you just sort of give this one treatment and hope that it would, it would help the spectrum of disorders? Another tough question is whether or not autism is really reversible. And there's sort of different opinions on that that I go into in the blog post. So you can uh, take a look at that. Certainly autism can change over time. And so um, I think there is some idea that there might be reversible types of autism to some extent at least. So this has all kind of led me to wonder whether or not this idea of giving IV cell therapies um, to kids to try to help autism, is it really fundamentally flawed? And I think it could be. And in fact, again, Duke's own data has been pretty discouraging on this front. There's, there was another trial that was run more in this kind of neck of the woods. I'm over here in California by Sutter, and they also found negative data. And other groups have found negative data as well. So there really hasn't been much to, to go on to uh, keep supporting this. Unfortunately, there's a lot of stem cell clinics out there in the world that are selling this idea of stem cells and core blood cells for autism and cerebral palsy and other conditions. And <clears throat> some of those are really predatory and I have a lot of concerns about those. And so it's sort of this weird situation because you've got these clinics and then for a time it was, it seemed like the Duke program, they are sort of the ones that are really more uh, enthusiastic about this idea you know, but things change over time. And in fact, uh, the big news related to Duke is that they, at least for the time being, have stopped their uh, compassionate use program of cord cells for autism. And there's one thing that's been sort of confusing about that is that I don't feel like there's been a real cl clear reason about uh, why the stop, you know, why have things halted? And I think what we're hearing is that, well, then the data was kind of negative, but they, they've known that for many years, right? Like three years now. And why why did the compassionate use program keep going for all those years if they already knew the data were negative? So it's kind of complicated. And another complicating factor is that Duke has this partnership with this company called Cryocell, where the goal seems to be to open uh, infusion clinics where kids would be kind of like the customers and get cord cells for autism or cerebral palsy or traumatic brain injury. But again, you know, if you're developing, you know, you're going to get these clinics going, you're going to um, essentially, it feels like the idea is they're going to sell these cord cell offerings. You know, how can you do that if the data are largely negative or at best in rare cases kind of mixed? Um, and so over the years, it's been interesting because uh, I've gotten a lot of contact from families wondering about this idea of cord cells for autism. And sometimes they're not really sure about their risks. And they get they've kind of got the impression that there is almost no risk. And I think that's that's something we really have to push back on. Um, and again, in part through educational outreach, we can do that because there there are going to be risks, you know, um, for any kind of medical procedure, getting getting cells, um, you know, it seems generally core blood cells are pretty safe, but it doesn't mean there's zero risk. Uh, also, when um, cord cells are administered to children, they're, the kids are often sedated. Um, to kind of, I guess, to make the process go more smoothly, but the sedation itself has risks. And the whole thing can be kind of traumatic for the kids and I think lead to, to setbacks. So 
that's something that concerns me. Uh, I've gone through some of these other things, you know, like there's sort of this weird dynamic out there of the proponents of cord cells for autism. So, you know, I think looking ahead, I, I hope that Duke will also stop their uh, expanded access program for cerebral palsy as well, because to me, it just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, maybe there's some very tiny chance they may, um, might have some benefit for some small percent of kids, but there, again, there are risks. You know, if you want to do clinical trials, I think that's one thing, but if you're actually charging people $15,000 to participate, you know, that's, that's something you have to be really careful about, I think. And that, that sort of brings to mind another issue here, and that is that the FDA has a role here. Duke has, it seems Duke has approval for these expanded access programs from the FDA to charge uh, for giving cord cells uh, to these kids. You know, should the FDA be allowing that? And, and I don't really know. And, and that also makes me wonder, you know, what happened again with Duke uh, stopping their expanded access program of cord cells for autism? Did the FDA have a role in that decision or did du uh, Duke just itself decide to go ahead and stop? So, you know, that's something we, we just don't really know. So kind of the take home here is that right now there's no good evidence that stem cells or specifically cord cells of any kind uh, can, can co concretely help kids with autism. There are definitely going to be risks. And I don't think anybody should be requiring people, uh, families to pay for something like this at this time. You know, maybe in the future, there could be some kind of cell therapy that, that helps autism or, or cerebral palsy or traumatic brain injury in some way. But it all has to rest on really good data, you know, data that's convincing, data that you don't have to kind of take apart after the fact to look for glimmers of, of positive things. So that's kind of where things stand. I'll go ahead and stop there now. So I wish there's better news on that front. You know, I, I wish there was more hope in terms of cell therapies for autism, but we have to be real about it because there's these are real kids who get these therapies, uh, quote unquote therapies that maybe really do no good. They do have some risks, they're expensive. So that's something that we shouldn't take lightly. So again, this is Paul Knopfler here at UC Davis. Thanks for watching this video and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.